to have you join us uh, this morning, even though virtually. Welcome again to Worship with Redeemer Church. Uh, we're glad to have you join us uh, this morning, even though virtually. Uh, we have a couple announcements. One is uh, the email that went out. Uh, the Shaws are going to be back in town. Uh, that'll be today to you. Uh, so they'll be at Mark Watson Park uh, today at 1230. And they invited everyone who would like to to come out and visit. Uh, we do encourage you to wear the mask, do social distancing, all those good things uh, that we are being uh, told to do now. But uh, they would love to have you come and visit, bring picnic lunch, and uh, have a good time with them. Uh, that is at Mark Watson Park, uh, the one behind the library. Uh, the cookout for uh, middle and high youth is going to be this afternoon from 4.30 to 7.30. That's at the Hicks House. Uh, if you have any questions about that, feel free to contact Pastor Hansen uh, or text him. Uh, your session is keeping an eye on the coronavirus uh, issue. Uh, we had decided to open again for worship on Jan July 5th. However, uh, we are seeing the increase uh, that we have right now in the state and in our county. Uh, so we want you to know that the session is discussing that. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, we are going to make an announcement very firmly what we're going to do, uh, whether we're going to cancel and push back our opening date again or if we're going to go ahead on the 5th. We're going to decide and let you know on Monday. So keep an eye on your email, on the church, church Facebook page, and on the church website. Uh, we will put it on all of those uh, so that you know. That'll be Monday. Uh, so let's see. Uh, if you have any needs, uh, things that you're going through, troubles you have uh, physically, spiritually, emotionally, please contact the leadership. Uh, elders and deacons are here for you. Uh, we want to hear from you. We want to help you, even if you just need someone to pray with you for a bit. Uh, we are very happy to do that. So, All right, let us move into the worship of our mighty God. Uh, hear our God, call us to his worship from Psalm 22. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, King of heaven and earth, we do glorify you as the Lord who hears and knows and sees all things. Father, we thank you that you hear us, your people, at all times in our joys and in our distresses. Father, we pray that you would hear and watch over us now this morning as we worship you. Uh, Father, please bless and strengthen us wherever you have scattered us to be. In your name we pray. Amen. Please take your worship materials and follow the YouTube link and sing uh, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Our first reading of scripture this morning is from 1 Samuel 21, verses 10 through 15, and I encourage you to follow along with me in your copy of God's Word. 1 Samuel 21, hear God's Word. And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands? And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Well, dear friends, David was afraid. David was afraid in that moment of uh, the human king uh, who ruled in the place where he was. And how often do we sin in our fear and our doubt and in not believing the words that our God has given us to trust in? Well, please pray our 
corporate confession of sin with me. Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue lay waste the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and turn them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Christ Jesus. Amen. Take a few moments to silently confess your sins before our great God. Dear brothers and sisters, our God does not leave us in these sins we confess and our many others. Hear his assurance of his pardon to us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. As I sometimes remind you, um, just because I'm up here in the pulpit doesn't mean I don't need these words to Every single person watching, listening, or participating, including me and your pastor, uh, needs these words because we are all sinners and we need to hear God's mighty grace given to us. Please join me in praying for our needs. Dear Heavenly Father, our greatest need of all, as you well know, is forgiveness. Father, we have offended your laws. We have broken the good commands that you have given us. And Father, most of all, we plead for that forgiveness. We plead for your salvation. Father, we thank you that you promise it to all those who come to you humbly in heart, looking to you for grace. Father, we can never earn it. Father, we can never do enough to please you. But Father, our sin is so great. Father, we thank you for your mighty grace. Father, we thank you that you treat us as sons and daughters. Father, we thank you that you hear us. Father, we plead today for many things. Father, we thank you for the safe return of the Seeley family here to Silva, Wokulawi. Father, we plead for Lori, Josh, and Elizabeth as they continue to grieve, uh, and as they continue to get settled here in Silva. Father, please uh, draw them to yourself, surround them with your love, and surround them with your church. Father, please help us to love them well also. Father, we plead for wisdom uh, for our leaders in our state, our nation, and here in our church body, uh, that we would make good decisions with the virus that's going on. Father, please help us to be wise, help us to open what needs to be opened and shut what needs to be shut. Father, we plead for our schools, for our businesses, for our parks, for our library, for our church. All of these things, please give us wisdom. Father, we plead for the students at Western. Uh, Father, they're in a hard spot uh, where they need to decide what to pay for in terms of housing, uh, what to pursue, uh, whether they, what is wise for them. Please give them and their parents wisdom also uh, in this decision. We pray that you would provide for them, uh, all those who will be here in the fall. Father, we plead for Kate Anderson. Uh, we lift her up. Uh, pray that you would strengthen her and refresh her over the summer, prepare her for ministry uh, with RUF. Father, we pray for her, particularly for her mother, uh, who is uh, battling cancer at this time. Father, we pray that your comfort would be with her, uh, strengthen and help her. And uh, Father, if it is your will, guide her home, guide her home. Father, please be with us all in our troubles and difficulties. Strengthen us in them. Help us to look to you first and last and always. 
In your name we pray. Amen. Please take your worship materials and follow the YouTube link and sing now, uh, Abide With Me. Good morning. Once again, welcome to Redeemer Church. Please grab your Bibles and turn to Psalm 34, but also Psalm 56. Psalm 34 and Psalm 56. A few moments ago, Lee read for us a small section of Scripture from the life of David, 1 Samuel 21. I mentioned that because the two Psalms that we are going to read portions from, as well as uh, deliberate some thoughts in the sermon, come from this incident. Uh, Psalm 34 and Psalm 56 were written by David as a response to that incident where he was in the land with the Philistines and he kind of acted like a crazy man out of fear of the king and fear of others. So turn in your Bible, please, to Psalm 34. We will read the first seven verses of this psalm and then we will flip over to Psalm 56 to read a few verses there. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. Psalm 34, verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. And now skipping over to Psalm 56, also written by David, as I said, going to read verses 8 through 11. You have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. And God, whose word I praise, and the Lord, whose word I praise, and God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Please pray with me. Father, we thank you for your eternal word. We recognize that it is living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword. Father, we pray that you give us ears to hear what you have to say. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I mentioned last week the very great Christmas story, uh, excuse me, a Christmas carol. Over 50 years ago, there was another Christmas story that aired on television, equally as great in my humble opinion, but Charlie Brown Christmas Special. Uh, If you're familiar with this story, which I'd imagine many are, Charlie Brown is depressed, and so he seeks out professional help from the local psychiatrist, which happens to be his friend Lucy Van Pelt. And so what follows is their dialogue together. Charlie comes up to her and says, I'm in sad shape. Hold up right there, Charlie Brown. I need five cents from you for my kind of advice. So we hear the clank of the can as the nickel goes in. Boy, I love the beautiful sound of cold hard cash. That beautiful, beautiful sound. Nickels, nickels, nickels. That beautiful sound of plunking nickels. Now what seems to be your trouble? Charlie Brown responds, I know I should be happy during Christmas, but I can't seem to manage it. Well, as they say on TV, the mere fact that you realize you need help indicates that you're not too far gone. I think we better pinpoint your fears. If we can find out what you're afraid of, we can label it. Are you afraid of responsibility? If you are, then you have hypogeophobia. How about cats? If you're afraid of cats, you have alarosphasia. Are you afraid of staircases? If you are, then you have climacophobia. Maybe you have philosophobia. This is a fear of the ocean. Or gephobia which is the fear of crossing bridges. Maybe you have pantophobia. Do you think you have pantophobia? Charlie Brown simply responds, what's pantophobia? The fear of everything. That's it. You know, we laugh at this, but it really is a reflection of life. And that is fear tends to grip us in many forms and in many avenues of our lives. We've heard it said that love is the universal language. Sadly, I think there's another universal language, and that is a language of fear. And that's because it doesn't matter what time period we live. It doesn't matter, geographically speaking, where we live. It doesn't matter if we're old or young. It doesn't matter if we're rich or poor, uh, our ethnicity or our gender. Those factors don't really contribute. Every single human being faces fear, including Christians. David was certainly no exception. Our text this morning, the Psalm 34 and Psalm 56 I mentioned, are based on an account in 
1 Samuel 21 that Lee read from. And you may recall that David is known in Scripture as the man after God's own heart. He was the giant killer. He was the chosen king of Israel. Yet he was also human, which meant he suffered and struggled with fear, as do you and I. In this particular account, uh, David is running from his life from Saul. He's thinking, if I can get away from Israel, if I can get away from Saul and the soldiers that are after me, I can go over here, kind of hang out and run and keep hidden from Saul. But what happens is, is that he is recognized while he's in the land of, of Gath, where the Philistines are currently residing. That presents quite a problem for David, because David has killed thousands of warriors of the Philistine army. And so out of fear, he decides to change his behavior a, a little bit. When we read Psalm 34 and Psalm 56, we are reading the reaction that David had to this incident. He clearly acknowledges that he was afraid of people, that he was afraid of circumstances, and yet he saw God show up and do something extraordinary. It's almost like God was saying to David, uh, listen, David, this is who and what you are afraid of, but you're forgetting the most important thing, me. Focus on me. Focus on who I am and what I can do and will do for you. If you have your scriptures open, I would invite you to look at verse 22. I think this is probably the key verse in Psalm 34, and I encourage you to underline it. David simply writes in this verse, The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Once David was reminded of this truth, his fears were really transformed. He went from the fear of people and circumstances to the fear of God. But this fear, unlike man-driven fear, was not paralyzing. It was life-given. It led David to worship, uh, to obedience, ultimately to a deeper relationship with the living God through faith. When we read these psalms and we read David's encounter with the Philistines, surely we can relate. Have you ever faced something so extraordinarily challenging that it was difficult for you to just even get out of the bed? Or maybe you've been so exhausted from crying that making simple life decisions seems like an impossibility. Or maybe there is something or someone in your life that you are so deathly afraid of that, again, you are paralyzed with fear, that you can't move forward. In recent months, we have all faced a variety of fears in a lot of different ways. Fear of this new virus that Lee mentioned a few minutes ago. Fear of the unknown, like school openings or school closing or business openings and business closings. Uh, we face fears of people, uh, particularly due to violent acts, due to racism, due to police brutality and discussions about reform and what that looks like, uh, riots and looting, just to name a few. But we need to remember, as David needed to remember, we're not alone. We don't face these fears alone. So this morning, looking at Psalms 34 and 56, we're going to see how the gospel really exposes our fears uh, transforms those fears and really changes them into godly fears. So the first thing I want us to see this morning is the fact that the gospel exposes our godly fears. The first thing we learn, uh, we need to remember, is that the gospel is both wonderful and terrifying at the same time. What I mean by that is, of course, the gospel is wonderful because it's the news that we cannot do for ourselves but God has done for us what we can't do for ourselves. That is wonderful news. That's why it's called the gospel, good news. On the other hand, the gospel is quite terrifying because the gospel puts a microscope where I quite honestly don't want one and where you probably don't want one, right in the middle of our heart. And it shows us what's going on deep inside of our hearts. First thing we see is that the gospel exposes our ungodly fears. Ungodly fears, several characteristics about those we'll consider for a moment. Ungodly fear is often grounded in the fear of people or in the fear of man. David was literally fleeing for his life. Ran away from King Saul, as we read, took um, sanctuary with King Achish and the Philistines. Um, but think about it this way. How desperate do you have to be if you think, okay, I can run away from this place and I'll be safe over here, never mind the fact that I have killed thousands of people from this land but I think I'll be okay there. Obviously, David was in a very desperate situation. Scholars believe that David was thinking was perhaps he would go and work as a mercenary for King Achish. 
He was obviously hoping that he could lay low and not be uh, recognized, but that was the problem. Somebody did recognize him and knew him from the song that the Israelites had sang, that Saul had killed his thousands while David had killed his tens of thousands. This terrified David. So if you have your scripture, look at Psalm 56. I'm going to read the first two verses in verse 6, and we'll really see this fear of man coming out in David's words. David writes in Psalm 56, Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. David was terrified, legitimately so. So out of fear, what does he do? He quickly changes his behavior. As Lee read, he lets spit come down his beard. He starts writing on the walls of the city gates, basically starts acting like a crazy man. Some would say that David was just simply uh, being shrewd as a serpent, as Jesus would later recommend in the New Testament. Others say that it was wartime ethics. And what they mean by that is it was okay for David to do what he did, given the circumstances. But here's the thing. David lied. He wasn't insane. He wasn't a madman. He had control of his bodily functions. Uh, he intentionally made the spit come down. And Scripture tells us in verse 12 of 1 Samuel 21, the reason he did this, fear. Ungodly fear of man often leads us to make decisions such as these. Second, ungodly fear often focuses on circumstances in addition to focusing on people. Again, think about David's situation for just a moment and how we can see how he literally went from something bad, King Saul, to something worse, living in the land of the enemy. It's like that old saying, uh, out of the frying pan and into the fire. Ungodly fear often cannot see past our circumstances that we might be facing. But here's a key difference between ungodly fear and godly fear. Ungodly fear never gets past the circumstances to the one, meaning God, who controls all circumstances and all things. We just finished our study of Job last week, and we saw that repeatedly, that Job struggled with that as well. Our circumstances have a way of limiting our vision, um, taking our eyes and focus off the goodness of God. Third, ungodly fear often paralyzes us. Uh, ungodly fear has what I would say is a nasty tendency of causing us to literally shut down or perhaps pulling away from others in our lives, prevents us from engaging uh, life in the way that God desires for us, prevents us from uh, getting involved in situations when we should get involved. This paralyzing effect of fear prevents us from living the full life that Jesus not only came that we would have, but that he gave his own life that we would have. Many years ago uh, in the American West, it was a very difficult time to live. Uh, there was a robber by the name of Black Bart. He was a professional thief. And his very name, Black Bart, struck fear as he terrorized the Wells Fargo stage line. All the way from the west coast, San Francisco, to the east coast of New York City, uh, his name became synonymous with danger and robbery. Between 1875 and 1883, uh, it's been listed that he robbed 29 different stage coach crews. But here's the amazing thing about it. He did it without firing a single shot. He did it without being tracked by uh, any um, sheriffs of any kind. He was eventually caught through some good detective work. Um, he never had any victims. No victims ever saw his face. So what worked for him? Just his name. Fear gripped people so that when people realized that it was Black Bart who was robbing them, even the bravest of men just would give in to his demands. It's just a great example of how fear often paralyzes us and hinders us greatly in our lives. We see a fourth characteristic of ungodly fear, and that's this, that it can often change us or manipulate us. What I mean by that is ungodly fear has the ability to cause you and I to do things or to say things that we would not normally do or say, or to do or say things that we know are wrong. You can argue whether or not David was right in lying to the king and to the Philistines in order to save his life, but the bottom line is he was terrified. And then that uh, aspect of being terrified, he told a lie. His ungodly fear led him to do something that is not honoring to the Lord. Ungodly fear has the, the tendency to cause you and I 
to do similar things. For example, um, our high school students, they might be at school, they might be at an athletic event or a social gathering of some kind, and they witness a child or a student being bullied um, in some capacity. But out of fear of what the other students would think about them, maybe they don't speak up on their behalf. Maybe they kind of turn a blind eye. Maybe, maybe they even join in on bullying this particular student. I would imagine that many of us, sadly, could probably think of stories where we've done something like that ourselves. So this morning, here's a question to ask ourselves. Where is God exposing ungodly fear in our own lives? Is it the fear of people? Uh, is there a relationship in our life, a boss, a coworker, a neighbor, a coach that just seems to have a hold on us? Or maybe it's circumstantial. Maybe it's our health issues or health issues of those we love dearly. Maybe there's job concerns or other uh, unfortunate and uncontrollable life issues that hold us captive. These fears often lead us to being hindered and paralyzed in our day-to-day activities. They also, also can lead us to change our behavior or to act in a way that's not reflective of who we are. David struggled in this area. We know that because we read the incident this morning. We struggle in this area as well. But it's not what God has intended, and as we're about to see, there is a remedy for us. And that leads us to the second point. The gospel doesn't simply expose our ungodly fears. The gospel rescues and redeems us from those ungodly fears. Reread verse 22 with me that we read a few minutes ago. David writes, The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. This is an Old Testament pointer to the gospel. And I want to challenge everyone who's listening to this sermon to memorize this verse this week. Highlight it in your Bible. Put a little star. Maybe make a little index card and put in your car or something. Have your children memorize it. Discuss it with them over meal times. Uh, discuss it with them maybe at prayer times before you go to bed. Uh, this is a great verse. And the truth is, Jesus is not mentioned by name in this verse. But we know from the New Testament that Jesus is God's chosen one to redeem his people. This Hebrew word for redemption here, you probably know, means ransom. It means to pay back something. It also means to rescue. And so you think about all the ways that God rescues his people. He rescues us from eternal damnation. He rescues us from physical sufferings. He rescues us from the attack or the judgmental nature of others. And sometimes he rescues us from our very own fears. He rescues us from struggling with fearing people or circumstances. Uh, He rescues us from our own failures, uh, just as David failed in this capacity. And so while 22 is the crucial verse here, this redemptive language that God redeems his people is all over both Psalm 34 and Psalm 56. And so have your Bibles open. Turn to Psalm 34, verse 4. We're going to start there and just look at some highlight of verses from each one. Psalm 34, 4. God says, or David says that God delivered him from all his fears. Verse 6. God saved David out of his troubles. Verse 17, the Lord delivered him out of his troubles. Verse 18, the Lord saves the crushed in spirit. Verse 19, the Lord delivers out of all his afflictions. Verse 22, the Lord redeems the life of his servants. And now skipping over to Psalm 56, verse 8, this is another great verse that I would highly encourage you to highlight or star or underline. David writes this, you have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? What a great verse that shows us the heart of the father towards his children. Also, Psalm 56, 13, God has delivered David's soul from death. These are words of someone of faith, but more importantly, there's someone whose faith is in the living triune God. Christian missionary Watchman Nee many, many years ago once said, faith looks at not what happens to him, but at him whom he believes. In other words, faith looks not at what happens to us individually, but rather at him in whom we believe. Many of you already know, but a few months ago, uh, Debbie and I, our middle son Grayson, was having a lot of physical pain, so we took him to Harris to the emergency room. And when we got there, he was diagnosed with appendicitis. And so the doctor showed up and said, Mr. Hansen, um, here's the deal. Your son has appendicitis. It means his appendix has burst. He's having a little bit of an infection in his stomach. That is what's contributing to the pain that he's having. It's going to continue to be painful for him, and eventually it it could cause death. Thank you for coming in. The billing department is right down here. Uh, You can pay your bill, and we'll see you later. Okay, all of that happened except for the last part. That would have been 
crazy if they would have just sent us on our way without offering any kind of help. I mention that because that's what the gospel does. The gospel shows us what the problem is. The gospel exposes my ungodly fears. It exposes your ungodly fears. But perhaps more importantly, the gospel redeems us and rescues us from those ungodly fears. It doesn't just show us what the problem is, but offers the solutions. Of course, the doctors and the caregivers at Harris were wonderful, and they loved our son very well as he went on that recovery process. But there's a third thing the gospel does, and that is the gospel instills in us godly fears. If ungodly fears are man-made or maybe man-generated or, jan- or man-focused, then godly fears are certainly fears that are focused on the living God. The Proverbs tell us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And similarly, if you look at what David says in Psalm 34, verse 11, we read, he says, Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. In other words, godly fear can be taught and communicated to others, to our children, to our spouses, to each other. The writer of Ecclesiastes spends 12 chapters contemplating the meaning and purpose of life. Why am I here? What is my life supposed to look like? What should I be doing? And really, chapter 12, verse 13 is the end statement where the writer simply says this. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. David clearly tells us that God instills godly fear of himself, godly fear of the Lord. But what are the results? We're going to look at those briefly. First, godly fear always leads to worship. As David reflected on his situation with Achish, as he thought about his own self-preserving actions and attitudes, as he contemplated God's gracious response to him, he was humbled. And this led him to worship. Look at Psalm 34. First, we're going to look at verse um, 3. And then in verse 8, David says this, I will bless the Lord or worship at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. In other words, not my praise, not my ability to think quick on my feet and lie to this king and deceive him. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Taste and see that the Lord is good. To really know the triune God is to worship him and to fear him. To fear God is to focus on who he is and what he has done for us in Christ. Always leads to worship. Again, go to Psalm 56 very quickly. Look at verse 3 and 4. David says this, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God. In God whose word I praise, I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Godly fear always leads to worship. Second, godly fear not only leads to worship, but also leads to obedience. Notice that David says in verse 11 that I just read that he will teach us the fear of the Lord. How does he follow that statement? What is the secret to learning to fear the Lord or to fear God? Well, we see it in verses 12 and 13. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. We see that David was a man who obeyed the God, who obeyed God. Of course, he didn't always obey God. He struggled with obedience, just as you and I struggle with obedience as well. But he certainly was a man who sought to obey the Lord. Again, if you go to Psalm 56, looking at verse 12 and 13, we read the following. David says, I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light of light. David clearly says that he obeys God. I must perform my vows. But notice the order here. David performs his vows, or he seeks to obey the Lord after God has delivered his soul from death in verse 13. God is always the initiator. He saves us, and then we respond in humble obedience. Kind of reminds me of the New Testament writer John in 1 John 4, 19, where he says, we love because he, meaning God, first loved us. We obey because he has redeemed us. We are not redeemed because we obey. We are redeemed because of Christ's obedience. So if we desire to learn how to fear God, then a simple way we can begin to do this is by knowing him in his word, 
We're called to read, to study, um, by the help of the God's Holy Spirit, apply the Word to every aspect of our lives. This is a lifelong process that's called sanctification. And of course, this side of heaven, none of us will ever achieve perfection. But obedience is a telltale sign of how someone is doing, spiritually speaking. Jesus once told his disciples that if they love him, they will obey him. They will keep his commandments. I once heard a Christian missionary at my former church, Redeemer South, was visiting, and he said a statement like this. He said, if you know God, then you will love him. If you love God, you will obey him. If you're not obeying God, maybe it's because you don't love him. And if you don't love God, maybe it's because you don't know him. That is certainly something to consider. To fear and respect God is to obey him. Think about it this way. Um, I can tell my wife a hundred times a day that I love her, and I should. But if my actions don't match those words, then she may begin to wonder, does he really love me? He says he loves me, but he's not helping with chores. He says he loves me, but he's yelling at me. He says he loves me, but his actions aren't matching up. Uh, That is what's going uh, on here. But I would also encourage you to remember this. If you're like me and you tend to maybe beat yourself up a little bit because you clearly see your failures or you clearly see your sin, which is a good thing, remember Psalm 34, 22. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. Third, godly faith, or excuse me, godly fear leads to faith. And while David certainly gave into his fear in this particular situation, perhaps the most important thing is what he learned as a result. He was reminded that God truly is a God that saves his people. Only God and not ourselves or others is our hope of salvation. Uh, Again, I've been convicted of this personally in my own life because I've noticed a trend. If I'm facing a difficult decision or if I'm facing a struggle of some sort, I'm very quick to ask godly friends or to even ask Debbie, hey, what do you think about the situation? What do you think I should do? And that's a good thing. I'm not discounting that at all. Those are all God-given gifts to me. The problem is I'm noticing that sometimes I'm quick to go to others before I go to God himself. David had to uh, relearn that, as do we all. Great preacher in England, Charles Spurgeon, once said this, Let your cares drive you to God. I shall not mind if you have many of them, if each one leads you to prayer. If every fret makes you lean more on the beloved, it will be a benefit. So in other words, as we face these anxieties, for David, it was fear of people, it was fear of being caught by his enemy and perhaps both humiliated and maybe even publicly publicly executed, but those fears drove him to the Lord. It should do the same for us. Oftentimes we forget who we're joined to and to whom we can take our every anxiety and fear. Uh, David made this mistake. He let his fear and his emotions get the better of him and he made a a rash decision. Sometimes we struggle in the same capacity. Look back at Psalm 34 and just hear some key verses as David reflects on this incident, beginning uh, in verse 4. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Verse 6. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord camps around those who fear him and delivers them. Skipping down to verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And verse 22, the Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. These words of confidence and faith are the words of a true believer. When God graciously works in us and instills godly fear, it leads us to further faith and acknowledgement of our dependence upon him. Godly fear leads to incredible faith and trust in the one that we know is faithful. There's a Scottish pastor by the name of Alexander McLaren who said this once, Faith, which is trust, and fear, faith and fear, are opposite poles. If a man has the one, he can scarcely have the other in vigorous operation. He that has his trust set upon God does not need to dread anything except the weakening or the paralyzing of that trust. We have been reminded very painfully over the past four to six months that life is not only difficult, it is quite terrifying at times. I've talked to so many people recently that are legitimately horrified and just terrified of a lot of different things. 
Uh, they're afraid of the coronavirus. We're afraid of continuing health worries for ourselves and others. We're afraid of this divisiveness that we see raging in our country right now, uh, particularly over racial injustice, social justice, how to handle police brutality, um, how to handle reform, um, even fear over doing deep soul work like looking at our own hearts and what's going on inside there. But as we learn from God's Word this morning, our hearts are so often filled with things that we don't like or maybe even realize that are there. I don't know because I'm not God, but I would imagine that prior to this incident with Achish and the Philistines that David would have said, oh yes, I trust in the Lord implicitly. And yet he obviously uh, struggled in that area as we all do. Same thing for Peter. Uh, Jesus, I'll never abandon you. And Jesus tells him flatly, uh, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. David had to relearn an important truth in his encounter with the Philistines, a truth that you and I need to relearn as well. And that truth is this. God in his goodness and his patience really does redeem our fears. He changes them into godly fears, fears that lead us to worship. It's why we long to come back to worship. It's why with a heavy heart, Lee tells us at the beginning, we're still evaluating the situation. We want to make the wisest and best decision possible, but we want to worship, and we want to worship with each other because God has instilled that a healthy fear in us. He also has given us fear to obey his commands, uh, to live by faith and not by sight, regardless of what others may do or say in our lives. So as you go out to the week that the Lord has called you to, please know that I am praying for you this verse, for you and your family. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Father, we thank you for this incredible truth this truth that is a reflection of your heart for sinners. Lord, you not only forgive us, you not only save us, Lord, but you redeem us from our fears. You redeem us from our failures. You redeem us and bring us into a right relationship with you that you would desire to walk with us. Father, we read from David's words that many are the afflictions of the righteous. Sadly, we have faced this in recent months. We have seen the afflictions of individuals. We have seen the afflictions of a groups of people. We have seen the afflictions of the nation. And so, Father, we look and we turn to you. Lord, thank you that you are a God who redeems his people. May we continue to place our trust in you and in you alone. In Christ's worthy name we pray. Amen. I invite you to take your worship material and let us confess our faith together this morning. We will be using one verse from Isaiah, Isaiah 41.10. It felt very appropriate given the content of the verses that we looked at this morning. So I ask you this morning, Christian, what do you believe? We believe the Lord our God when he says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dis dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Take your materials and follow the link, and we'll conclude the service by singing, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Glad that you were able to join us for worship this morning. Please know, as Lee mentioned, that the leaders and I continue to daily pray for you if you have any needs whatsoever please do not hesitate to reach out to us to let us know how we can continue to pray and to serve you or your family in any capacity. As you go to the week the Lord has called you to hear his blessing, I offer the blessing of the Lord to you in his name. The Lord bless, bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen.